Okay, dear friends, uh, my topic for today is uh, faith as the basis of morality. But actually, and uh, this week I'm going to talk about faith as the basis of morality. And next week I want to talk about faith as the basis of humanity and society. So first, faith is basis of morality. Now the truth is that I really want to talk about faith as the, the base as the human psyche. And uh, it'll also be, of course, connected to faith is the basis of morality. I'll begin by a story. And um, about uh, 200 years ago, there was a German philosopher by the name of Immanuel Kant. And uh, he was a colleague of, um, <clears throat> of Moses Mendelssohn, who was considered the founder of the Jewish Enlightenment in Germany. Mendelssohn was his elder. And when uh, Kant was a young man, Mendelssohn won a prize for his uh, philosophy, and they were in the same university. But they got to know each other despite the difference in years. And uh, Kant never understood Judaism. <laughs> it seemed to him very perplexing, because for him, Judaism meant the Old Testament. And what he couldn't understand was, in the Old Testament, there is no promise of anything but an earthly reward. The Torah in Vaikra and Leviticus, and in Deuteronomy, Devarim, chapter 28, Leviticus 26 and 7, and uh, Devarim 28, in the places which are called the blessings and the curses, these are all physical and national blessings and curses. And the Torah says, Im telechu, if you follow my precepts, uva mitzvotai and you follow my commandments, v'natati gishmechem bi'itam, and I shall give the rain in its proper time, and the land shall give its plenty, and the, free, the trees shall bear their fruit. So it all seems to be very physical, very agricultural. But Kant wondered, how can you have a moral society if you are not promising human beings something in the afterlife, which he referred to as the summum bonum, in the ultimate good of the world to come. But the five books of Moses never talks about the world to come. So he found that very perplexing. Why do I mention this? Because for Kant, the rationalist, he thought that for people to do the good thing, they have to be at least promised something in a world to come. Or else, what's, what are they going to get out of it? This is the same man <clears throat> who believed that people have to be autonomous in their moral decision-making. And in another work, in a work that he wrote called The Prolegoma, Prolegomena of Future Metaphysics, Kant actually argues that the very fact that people um, want to do the right thing or believe that in doing the right thing they will have a place in some type of world to come. This could be actually a basis of understanding metaphysics because there seems to be a psychological basis within human beings which point towards metaphysics. Because for Kant, the middle-aged arguments, the arguments of the middle ages for God and the existence in God, uh, he felt were lacking. But the very fact that human beings want to do the right thing and keep away from evil because they believe there's an ultimate good, this seems to point to some new place to start understanding what metaphysics, metaphysics might be all about. So for Kant, people are moral because they believe in something greater, a greater good than human beings. Because if not, well, when we grow up, they always tell us that crime doesn't pay. But the criminals know that crime does pay. <laughs> because when you do a small crime, you will be arrested, you can be intimidated. But if you do a great, massive crime, you just go down in history. 
So <clears throat> large crimes are hard to stop. I think there's an expression where they say, if you haven't made payments to the bank, you can start getting nervous because the bank is going to call you. But if you uh, loaned uh, $30 billion from the bank and you didn't pay the bank, then it's the bank manager who loses sleep. So for the average person, it's they who lose the sleep. <clears throat> so in the same sense, you have, um, so people are taught that crime doesn't pay, but these are not good arguments in the end of the day. Because in the end of the day, a person has to learn how to be um, morally autonomous. And um, so for Kant to be morally autonomous, you have to have something further than that. People must believe in some greater good, which is above them. Changing over to another thinker, Viktor Frankl, in the 20th century, when he wrote his famous book called Man's Search for Meaning, which he developed that book based on his experiences in the death camps of Auschwitz, Birkenau. Frankel, of course, tells in the book how he was totally stripped of his humanity. He walked in, a professor of psychology, psychoanalysis, and uh, it was all meaningless. They took everything away from him, even his book, which was the hardest for him, because he felt like he was nothing, and it really didn't matter. So what he had to do is he had to become his own patient. And he had to try to analyze what was going on with the people around him to somehow detach himself from the circumstances that were surrounding him. And one of the things that he discovered was that when people have faith in a goal, in a loved one, when they have purpose in their life, they become stronger. Take that purpose out of their life. Make them devoid of meaning and purpose, and they are weak and fragile and will be broken. He tells the story there of a certain man who had a dream. And in that dream, he dreamt that in February, the war would be over. Well, it was November, so that was not a problem. And um, <clears throat> so through November, through December, he was fine. January, he was also fine. A week before the end of January, he wasn't looking so good, but he was still okay. But February 1st was approaching. And as February 1st came and he realized that his dream was wrong, he died. So Frankel says it's this meaning in our lives, whatever it might be, whether it's religious or social or love and kinship, these are things that give people power and energy and meaning and the ability to survive the vicissitudes of their circumstances. And without this, we don't have the greatest strength of mankind. So faith, therefore, should be understood. It's not an adjective to believe. It's the use of a power within the human psyche. It's a power which gives us meaning. The Taman and Eruvin, which was just finished recently, and I hear on Torah Talks, they were talking about the Taman and Eruvin, on the Dafyomi, they finished it recently. The Talmud says that a person can carry on the Sabbath in a public area up to four cubits. Araba Amot. But the Talmud says, why four cubits? Where did the rabbis get this idea of four cubits? 
Every cubit is approximately half a meter. So that's about two meters. You can carry for two meters in a public area, and then you have to put it down. Then you can carry another two meters and put it down. So the Talmud says, where does the idea of the two meters come from? The four amot, the cubits, which is the size of your hand from the from the hand to the elbow, is uh, what was used in the Torah when they use the the um, when they talk about the size of the tabernacle, the mishkan. So the Talmud says, why four cubits? Because the Talmud says, because that's the size, that's the area that a human being covers when they lie down. Because the Talmud says the average human being is three cubits high, which would be about a meter and a half. By the way, based on skeletons of Roman soldiers, Roman legionnaires from the Second Temple period, it does seem that the average Roman soldier was approximately a meter 50. Anywhere a meter 45 to meter 55. They were short. They were cruel. <laughs> so, so the Romans seemed to be a little bit short. And uh, so to say the human beings at that time were a meter and a half is very possible. So what's the third cubit? Because you just said, what's the fourth cubit? Excuse me, because you just said that the three cubits of the human being was the fourth. So Thomas says, when you're lying down and you outstretch your arm over your head, that's another cubit. Because when I put my arm over my head, here's my elbow, that's another cubit high. So when I'm lying down, I can reach four cubits with my arm extended over my head. The Hasidim, in Hasidic writings, they explain what are the four cubits? What does that mean? Well, the three we know. The cubit of the head is called thought. The cubit of the heart is called emotion. And the lower cubit, where the arms and the legs go, that's called action. Meaning the arms drop down and so do the legs. So you have thought, emotions, and action. So then what's the arms over the head? And the Hasidim would say that's belief. Because it doesn't it say in the story of Moses, when the Israelites were falling, fighting Amalek. So it says that Moses raised his hand and the Israelites were beating Amalek. And when Moses lowered his hand, then Amalek was winning. And then Aaron and Hur held up Moses' hands so that the Israelites would win. And says, Vahiyadav emuna ad bo hashamesh. And his hands were faithful until the sun came up that whole night. Or a bo hashamesh could be the sun went down. Ad bo hashamesh. Because they usually fought during the day anyhow at that time. So Ad Bar Shemesh is probably until the sun went down. So, um, but the point is that raising the hands became a symbol of faith. So the Hasidim say the raising of the hand represents faith, emuna, which is slightly above the head. By the way, in the temple te second temple period, prayer was often done with uh, upraised hand, hands. And also in biblical times, by the way, the raising of the hand was a sign of an oath sworn to heaven, like Abraham and uh, the king and the four kings in Genesis uh, chapters 13, 14. Okay. What does this mean? Emuna, when we talk about faith, we have to first talk about an element, an ability within the human psyche. It's not just my intellect believing in something. It is part of the mental process, which is called faith. This is the way, by the way, it's understood in Hasidic writings, and I'll also explain how it's understood in Kabbalistic writing. <clears throat> so, let me start by... So we talked about four levels. Emuna, which is faith. Machshava, thought. Midot, emotions. Maaseh, actions. Now, in the um, commentary of the Vilna Gaon, to Zohar, the Tikkunei Zohar, he says that in human thought, you have five levels, which he calls Ratzon, 
or we'll call it five levels of the head. The inner will, thought, hear hur, which means analytical thought, sound, speech. These are five levels within the head. The first three relate to the brain. The last two relate to the voice, which is voice and speech. But the first three, will, thought, analytical thought. This is also, by the way, in Kabbalistic literature, this is called Keter Chochva Ubina, Keter, which is very often paralleled with the will in the Kabbalistic writings from the 12th to the 16th century. Uh, sometimes the will is with Chochmah, but most of the time it's with Keter. Then Chochmah is called, um, uh, it's called, um, I'm trying to think of the right English word uh, for this, intuition, intuitive wisdom, or the beginning of wisdom. And then you have analytical thought, which is called bina, the intellect. Sometimes it's called um, will, um, wisdom, and intellect. <clears throat> and when wisdom and intellect inter uh, combine, they formulate knowledge, which is the outcome, like the child. So this is, by the way, interesting because in Kabbalistic writings, Human will is above thought. And it's also above, it's basically above the intellect. In um, philosophical writings in the Middle Ages, there's nothing above intellect. Human beings are the highest element of human beings, like in Rambam's writing, is the intellect. And uh, in the Middle Ages, when they believed that they're the stars em were embodiments of intellect, higher intellects, and that the angels were higher intellects, and God was the, the ultimate perfect intellect which thinks itself, because all wisdom is contained within. So they could not think of, fathom anything above intellect. In Kabbalistic writings, intellect, thought, wisdom is part, or if you might say these are adjectives, these are descriptions of the human being, but it's not the ultimate human being. It's not the I. It is my thought. It is my wisdom, but it's not me. The I, for the Kabbalists, what I call myself, is the inner will, which is subconscious. And therefore, it is above thought. It is above intellect. Even intuitive thought. And intuitive thought is very high. There's actually an interaction, a constant interaction between the inner will and intuitive thought. So, <clears throat> what is this? <clears throat> to understand this, what is the inner will? The inner will is very similar to what we call the will to survive. Every human being has a will to live. It's like in the, it's in this, it's in the old brain, in the small brain, like the in the amygdala. This inner will, the will to survive, is something very um, innate within the human being, and it's a natural sense, which is implanted within our brains, of survival, and because of that. It's also very hard to affect it. When people get very depressed, they actually can affect the will to survive and they will start getting sick and other things will start happening too. And then to switch back, that off switch that you hit in your uh, old brain is very hard to switch on again. You have to work on it at least as much time as you worked on turning it off. That's why depression can be so damaging because it can, as I said, it could accidentally hit that off switch within our psyche. And to turn it on takes many, many months and sometimes years to get the person back on track again. Because that inner will, you don't affect it directly, it's always indirectly. 
and has to be convinced. It doesn't get convinced by intellectual arguments. It has to know that that's what you really mean, which takes a long time. So the inner will is very similar. The inner will is the DNA of our souls. What somebody once called a soul print is the DNA of our souls. So it knows exactly what we're supposed to be doing, even when we don't, by the way. But we discover it uh, throughout our lives. Now, let me explain. <clears throat> Faith feeds the inner will. You build faith through intuitive thought, which is called wisdom. I told you it goes keter chokma bina, which is will, intuitive thought, analytical thought, or intellect. So the intuitive thought, which is very connected, by the way, with emuna, with faith, which is also connected close to the inner will, it feeds the inner will. When you develop faith within yourself, it strengthens the inner will, it strengthens your direction. Now, what exactly is intuitive thought? <laughs> Let me try to explain this. <clears throat> in science, which is very analytical, and in general, Western thought is analytical, um, science starts by um, science has laws and formulas but to create a formula or to come up with a new hypothesis of a formula you need the hypothesis let's understand what a hypothesis is a hypothesis is a scholarly guess an intuitive feeling that you might be right based on your experience. I mean, if just some guy comes along and tries to guess what's going to happen in physics, it means nothing. But if a well-known physicist who's been teaching for years and researching for years, based on their research, feels, wow, this might be the next step in physics, <clears throat> that scholarly guess based on their um, knowledge and intuition based on this knowledge, <clears throat> which is an attempt to look forward, like the Mishnah says, Ezeu chacham haroet anolad, who is the one with intuitive thought, the one who can see the future, because this is what intuition does. It creates the ability of hypothesis. And hypothesis is a very educated guess. And that's why it has a very good chance of hitting the mark. Sometimes it's wrong. But even if it's wrong, it's not usually too far off the mark. And if a lot of people aim, they're going to hit the mark eventually. So the hypothesis, then, is the belief system of science. If you understand that, you understand how science is also based on faith. Because all scientific knowledge needs the hypothesis, which is this educated intuition. Man in general needs faith. Faith is the ability to go forward, to see in the dark, beyond where we are at this moment, based on our knowledge, not based on nothing. It has to go hand in hand with reason and the intellect. <clears throat> and the results then of our intuitive knowledge, verified through our analytical knowledge, this strengthens the will, what I call feeds the will. Because the more we gain perspective on which way we're going, the stronger a desire to get there is going to be, and the stronger we will be as human beings. And very often we discover within ourselves a propensity, a sort of like a direction which already exists within ourselves, which we find within uh, through this uh, intuitive knowledge and through this faith. The word faith in Hebrew emuna comes from also the Hebrew word omanut, which means an art. It's the art of faith. It's a development of something which is already within our psyche. It's an ability to connect with a higher reality, which this higher reality already is within ourselves. 
So, because we're running out of time, let's bring it all around and get back to morality. The idea to want to do the good thing, which is an intuitive idea, which Immanuel Kant, who we mentioned at the beginning, called it a priori knowledge. Because he said that the idea that not to steal something which doesn't belong to me, not to take the life of somebody else because it's their life. So, and not to take somebody else's wife or property. These are innate statements and understandings of the human being, moral understandings, which are a priori. They're known before the fact. We understand them as truths. Actually trying to prove them intellectually is just going to take away from their meaning. Because if you're going to say, well, I don't steal, because if I stole, somebody could steal from me. Oh, so if you're invincible and nobody could steal from you, then it would be okay. No, that's not what I meant. So the arguments are a little bit lame in a priori beliefs. But Kant thought that morality is based on these a priori beliefs. Just like you have um, <clears throat> within, uh, let's say, geometry, you have uh, ideas which are um, based on, um, let's call it accepted norms and assumptions. Like the shortest route between two points is a straight line. So in the same way you have in also in um, morality, in Kant's thinking, the, um, the idea of the the idea of the a priori is something which is real knowledge, but it's intuitive real knowledge, which in Kabbalistic thinking we would call it the level of Chokhmah, as opposed to the level of Bina or Tabuna. But we are sure of the validity of this, even though we have difficulty proving it. Faith is on the exact same level. It's on the level of the a priori, but it has to be worked on it has to be developed, and it must be clarified by the intellect. So that faith needs the intellect to clarify it from mistakes. But the power of faith does not begin with the intellect. I will continue with this next time, because I also want to talk about how faith is the basis of human society. And that will be next week at this time. Thank you for joining. Shalom, shalom.